Hi there and welcome back to Psy Dance on YouTube. This is the third episode where we're looking at episode three from the podcast, which was talking to Ashley Ritchie about imagery. This episode is looking at Ashley's own research on imagery, but it's important to note that it's not necessarily from a dance science perspective, it's more of a pedagogic perspective. So Ashley's studies look at the use of imagery in both ballet and contemporary settings. This is interesting because Ashley notes how ballet might be more extrinsic, whereas contemporary seems to be more intrinsic. Contemporary seems to be more experimental, so it's accepted generally to have different approaches to movement material, um, and we spend time on things like somatic approaches to find our body in the space. Ballet's rich tradition and history might make the approach to ballet a little bit different. It's very codified and there's a specific way of doing things which we see is defined in the material and the way that we describe the material. It's not always this way but anecdotally this is kind of true so it's important as dance teachers it's kind of interesting to look at imagery in both of these different contexts. Imagery can be a really powerful tool that affects how we learn, remember and perform dance. Because imagery engages the same brain circuitry as training does, it can be a highly valid form of practice. It can support self-confidence, motivation and mood. It can help planning and goal setting and it can also aid the creative process. Looking at Ashley's studies then, both studies are built on the opportunity for constructive rest. This allows the body to rest but also to be active. It can aid injury prevention, boost holistic wellness and also might improve motor skill acquisition. There's more in this paper which I'll put up just here. But in Ashley's studies, this idea of constructive rest became more important just for the students to be relaxed and comfortable. The key thing was that this period of rest was purposeful, so it was thinking and engaging in this activity. Ashley's studies used types of imagery such as guided imagery and cognitive specific imagery. Guided imagery is mostly used in a therapeutic context and usually involves guiding someone through a script to help induce change. Cognitive specific imagery refers to the imagery of skills. So this is directly picturing a set of skills in your mind and this could be from an inside or an outside perspective. Combining these helps ballet dancers to relax before working on new skills. So the guided imagery clears the headspace and then the cognitive specific imagery is more about the acquisition of new skills. Another key part of Ashley's work is the use of the revised applied model of deliberate imagery. So this takes elements from sport imagery and operationalizes these so that it works for sport, dance and exercise. It refers to how we construct imagery in a dance setting, so it's transferring it into a dance field. The model refers to the who, when, where, the function of imagery, the content of the imagery, the characteristics and the meaning, the imagery ability, and also the outcome. In creating imagery, we need to consider all of these things. There is some research that suggests that dancers with more experience of imagery might be better at the imagery, so practicing this might be useful. So if we look now at the findings of Ashley's research, we have body outcomes and mind outcomes. But Ashley does note that this might be unnecessarily dualistic, so holistically this probably actually all goes together. Ashley's work talks about an embodied understanding, so this is specific to the language that students used in describing their experiences. So in the studies, imagery was a pedagogic tool, so we had a cyclical process where we'd learn the material, implement the imagery and then revisit the material and try it again. So in this context then, in interviews afterwards that were qualitative, students used the word embodied to describe the experience of the material being in their body better the second time around. They were discussing the phenomena of just knowing the work better and possibly also were referring to the idea of flow. Flow refers to the idea of not having to think and just being able to do, so time just slips away and the body knows what to do with the feedback that it gets. In Ashley's studies, there may be some suggestion of student variability affecting imagery, but this is complicated and it's not easily defined. So for example, a student who really wasn't expecting it found that it actually did work. So willingness to commit might have something to do with it because the student did persevere. But in the first initial study, there was a student who worked really hard at it, but it just wasn't happening for them. So like all pedagogic tools, some things will work for students and some things won't work for other students. Ashley notes that as a teacher, employing lots of different learning methods and activities to get the best out of our students is really important. Another important part of seeing progress is giving our students the chance to collaborate and offer their own opinions, giving them autonomy over their learning. Having that input is key, which I'll look at more in a second. Students' perception of self-efficacy may also play a role, so that refers to their understanding of their own achievements. But Ashley does hesitate here, as they found that in the most recent studies, students couldn't see their own achievement or improvement in the same way that they had in previous studies. We couldn't necessarily see the impact of the imagery as well as Ashley could, or even as well as when we watched the videos back. So that might lead us to believe that we couldn't assess our self-efficacy as well as students could in other studies. 
As a teacher, it's important though to have students self-assess and to help them with understanding their own achievements. So going back to the impact of collaboration on learning, Ashley gave some advice to teachers on how to achieve collaboration in the studio. Teachers need to understand that student contribution is really, really important. So we need to look at it as a process of learning together and then we'll be better placed to move forwards. Students seem to learn more and make more progress when they have more input into the lesson, as opposed to just a watch me, copy me approach. This may mean using things like guided learning, guided discovery and peer learning, as opposed to just cued response. Ashley notes in her work that collaboration makes for a richer and more meaningful experience. So as a teacher who's wanting to get the best out of their students, we need to be asking ourselves, how am I teaching in a way that facilitates learning? Ashley's advice to teachers is to just go for it, just try it, even if it's just small little bits. It doesn't need to be a whole script, so just take two minutes, try imagery, and then try the exercise again. It doesn't need to be a massive activity, it can be quick, quiet and small, and it doesn't need to take loads of class time. Thanks so much for watching, and um, make sure you check out the full episode, it's available on Apple, Spotify and most other major podcast platforms. Season 2 of Psydance Podcast is coming on Monday the 1st of February, which is super exciting, so make sure you put the date in your diary and I'll see you soon.